We will now move on to the induction of new members. Will jo uh, Dr. Jocelyn Bell Burnell please come forward to the President's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the President. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Jocelyn Bell Burnell, visiting professor in the Department of Physics and professorial fellow at Mansfield College, University of Oxford, and pro-chancellor of Trinity College, Dublin. Jocelyn Bell Burnell is widely recognized as the individual responsible for the 1967 discovery of pulsars. With skill and perseverance, she overcame the skepticism and resistance of her senior colleagues to make one of the most important and dramatic discoveries in 20th century astrophysics. In 2000, she was awarded the American Philosophical Society's Magellanic Premium Medal. Later in her career, she worked in infrared, X-ray, and gamma-ray astrophysics. More recently, she's turned her attention to education, including the public understanding of science, where her contribution has been uniquely valuable. She has served as president of the Royal Astronomical Society, president of the Institute of Physics, and she's currently president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations. <laughs> Will Dr. Gerd Gigerentse please come forward to the president's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the president. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Gerd Gigerentse, director of the Center for Adaptive Behavior and Cognition at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development. Gerd Gigerentse's early work analyzed the history of the use of statistical concepts in the construction of psychological theory. His book, Simple Heuristics That Make Us Smart, began fleshing out Herbert Simon's adaptive view of bounded rationality, exploring how people endowed with limited cognitive capacities can use simple heuristics to make good decisions, despite being immersed in uncertainty. He and his colleagues developed ecological rationality, using experimentation and mathematical analysis to show how adaptive behavior emerges from a match of heuristics to environment. Gigerentse has applied these results to methods to teach students, doctors, and lawyers to be better decision makers, fostering intuitive Bayesian reasoning by representing statistical information as natural frequencies rather than single event probabilities. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations. <clears throat> Will Dr. Thomas C. Holt please come forward to the president's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the president. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Thomas C. Holt, James Westfall Thompson Distinguished Service Professor of American and African American History at the University of Chicago. Thomas Holt has made fundamental contributions to our understanding of how racism is shaped in practice, both in a historical context and in our own time. He's been a pioneer in resituating the history of the African American past firmly in an international and comparative context, one that includes Britain and the Caribbean, as well as the United States. He can upend chronological context. His magisterial history of Jamaica is bracketed by two revolts, of slaves in the 1830s and of black laborers in the 1930s, both essential to an understanding of the transition from slavery to freedom. Holt's writings are characterized by the skepticism and the deep archival research of the accomplished social historian. And in them, Holt always wrestles eloquently with some of the deepest problems of the human condition, finding guidance in the philosophies of Hegel, Bourdieu, and Lefebvre as he teases out how race and racism have been and are now 
being learned in the encounters of everyday life. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations. <laughs> Will Dr. Alexander Neamas please come forward to the president's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the president. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. President, I have the honor to present Alexander Neamas, Edmund N. Carpenter II, class of 1943, professor in the humanities and professor of philosophy and comparative literature at Princeton University. Alexander Neamas writes beautifully on a wide range of topics, from the most technical issues in ancient philosophy to the philosophy of Nietzsche, to questions about painting, poetry, television, and friendship that speak to both the professional philosopher and the educated lay reader. He combines a scrupulous attention to philology and textual criticism with a rare capacity to address the kinds of big questions about what it is to live a virtuous life that have engaged the best of the Western philosophical tradition since Plato. His Gifford lectures, now expanded into a book on friendship, are in the tradition of James's varieties of religious experience, the first Gifford lectures, in that both address the most fundamental of human interests. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society, held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations. Sir. <laughs> Will Dr. Robert B. Pippin please come forward to the president's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the president. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Robert B. Pippin, Evelyn Stephenson Neff, Distinguished Service Professor, Committee on Social Thought, and the Department of Philosophy at the University of Chicago. Arguably more than anyone else in the Anglo-American philosophical world, Robert Pippin is responsible for the very considerable rise of interest in Hegel's thought that has taken place since the publication of his path-breaking book, Hegel's Idealism, almost 20 years ago. For Pippin, Hegel is not simply one of the great figures of the philosophical past. Rather, from the first, he has found in Hegel an exemplary thinker for the present age, one whose writings have first to be understood in the context of problems inherited from Kant and his immediate successes, which can then be seen to bear closely on problems in the philosophy of mind, art, action, and continental and English language traditions. More recently, Pippin has ranged widely across the 19th and 20th centuries with magisterial essays on figures such as Nietzsche, Heidegger, Blumenberg, Gadamer, and Strauss, as well as a highly original book on the novelist Henry James. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations. Will Dr. Irene J. Winter please come forward to the president's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the president. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Irene J. Winter, William Dorr Boardman Professor Emerita in the Department of History of Art and Architecture at Harvard University. The title shows, chosen by her former students for Irene Winter's Festschrift Ancient Near Eastern Art in Context, summarizes aptly her distinctive contribution to the history of the ancient Near East. For Winter, archeology span and the textual evidence in Akkadian and Sumerian are indispensable foundations for interpreting works that often seem deracinated in modern discussions. Winter has emphasized the need to look at ancient sculpture from the standpoint of its role in its own society and contemporary ritual, rather than with imported aesthetic theories. In keeping with this contextual approach, 
She's been an eloquent advocate for the importance of provenance and for the protection of ancient sites, and the most influential teacher of Near Eastern art in this country in her generation. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations. Will Dr. Yves Alambois please come forward to the president's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the president. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Yves Alambois, professor in the School of Historical Studies at the Institute for Advanced Study. Yves Alambois is one of the most original and active critics of 20th century art working today. A pupil of Roland Barthes, he is equally at home in the theory and the history of the visual arts. In 2015, he published the first of four volumes of his monumental catalog of the American painter and sculptor Ellsworth Kelly, and is about to publish a 900-page catalog of the works by Matisse, including the famous wall paintings in the Barnes Collection. At the Society's April 2015 meeting, he gave a memorable paper, Can a Genuine Picasso Be a Fake? In addition to his many books, he's written 12 exhibition catalogs, about 50 articles, with titles as surprising and diverse as The Meteorite in the Garden and Painting as Trauma and numerous exhibition and book reviews. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations. Will the Honorable Elena Kagan please come forward to the President's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the President. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Elena Kagan, Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Elena Kagan's confirmation to the Supreme Court in 2010 capped a career spent at the highest reaches of legal academia and public policy. After graduating from Harvard Law School, her law teaching career began at the University of Chicago. She joined the Harvard faculty in 2001 and brought new energy to the law school as its dean from 2003 to 2009, leading a period of vigorous growth in both the faculty ranks and the physical plant. Her service as President Obama's first solicitor general representing the United States in the Supreme Court marked a return to Washington where she had held high-level policy jobs in the Clinton White House. In her current position, she's known for collegiality, clear writing, and most important of all, clear thinking. <laughs> By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Thanks for coming. Will Dr. Stephen J. Lippert please come forward to the president's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the president. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Stephen J. Lippert, Arthur Amos Noyes Professor of Chemistry at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Stephen Lippert is a leader in inorganic chemistry and ranks as a founder of bioinorganic chemistry. He structurally characterized the cisplatin DNA adduct, the first example to atomic detail of an anti-cancer drug bound to its biological target, as well as proteins bound to the platinated DNA adduct. These are key findings in establishing the mechanism of this important chemotherapeutic. His research on multi-iron centers in biology has been similarly pathbreaking. He provided the first functional models for di-iron di -iron protein chemistry, and he characterized the di-iron center of methane moxoagenase an important natural enzyme that converts methane to methanol. His work stands at the forefront of inorganic chemistry in beautifully linking coordinate, co coordination chemistry with biological function. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations.
Will Dr. Michael A. Marletta please come forward to the president's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the president. Now I, I have to kind of uh, reread some of what you heard Clyde read yesterday when Dr. Marletta presented his really fascinating paper on <coughs> nitric oxide, but um, I'll, read it, I'll read it briefly. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Michael A. Marletta, Professor of Chemistry, Professor of Molecular and Cell Biology, and the C.H. and Annie Lee Chair in the Molecular Biology of Diseases at the University of California at Berkeley. Working on the interface of chemistry and biology, Michael Marletta has made groundbreaking contributions to our understanding of an essential, essential cellular control system, nitric oxide signaling. Nitric oxide functions, as we learned yesterday, as a regulator in numerous biological processes, including blood vessel homeostasis, immune defense, and a broad range of neural functions. He's discovered the key nitric oxide producing enzyme nitrogen oxide synthase and the critical cellular target of nitrogen oxide soluble guanulate cyclase. <laughs> His work <laughs> has revealed essential mechanistic features of heme and nitric oxide binding proteins and obsessed nitrosation. A guiding principle of his research has been his astute use of evolutionary relationships and of structural analysis to discover and illuminate molecular mechanisms. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society, held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations, Martin. <laughs> Will Dean Martha Minow please come forward to the president's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the president. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Martha Minow, Jeremiah Smith, Jr. Professor and Dean of Harvard Law School. Martha Minow is one of the nation's leading scholars on law and education and is an expert in anti-discrimination law, particularly the rights of racial and religious minorities, women, children, and persons with disabilities. Her 2010 book, In Brown's Wake, examine the underappreciated legacy of the landmark Brown against Board of Education as an inspiration for educational advocacy beyond the specific question of race. In a challenging time for legal education, she's led an important reevaluation of the law school curriculum, helping to bring courses in international law and regulatory law into the traditional common law canon. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society, held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations. <laughs> Will Ms. Joyce Carol Oates please come forward to the President's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the President. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Joyce Carol Oates. Roger S. Berlin, 52, Professor in the Humanities and Professor of Creative Writing Emerita at Princeton University. Joyce Carol Oates is a leading American person of letters. As a prolific and elegant writer of fiction, nonfiction, drama, and poetry for over five decades, to the delight and astonishment of readers and critics, she probes a vast range of contemporary issues and themes, including poverty, race relations, crime and violence, childhood and adolescence, love, sexuality, and the roles of women, the movie industry, the boxing industry, the American city and suburb, and the American university. She has authored sympathetic and satiric fictionalized versions of public figures as diverse as Marilyn Monroe, Ted Kennedy, and Woodrow Wilson. And as an erudite critic, she's written brilliantly of, for example, Emily Dickinson and Edgar Allan Poe, Henry James, and Simone Weil. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Will Dr. Rogers M. Smith please come forward to the President's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the President. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Rogers M. Smith, Christopher H. Brown Distinguished Professor of Political Science, Chair of the Penn Program on Democracy, Citizenship, and Constitutionalism, and Associate Dean for Social Sciences at the University of Pennsylvania. 
a leading scholar of American public law and the politics of membership, Roger Smith's work proceeds on both normative and empirical tracks. His early normative scholarship defended a liberal jurisprudence, spelling out its implications for U.S. Supreme Court decisions and American constitutional purposes. His empirical work documented competing visions of citizenship in U.S. history, culminating in his widely acclaimed 1997 book, Civic Ideals. This work detailed the liberal and Republican traditions more richly than had hitherto been attempted and recast debates about American ex exceptionalism, providing the impetus for his subsequent normative scholarship in the course of which he's made extensive contributions to the literatures on affirmative action, immigration, and minority representation. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations. Will Dr. Donald M. Berwick please come forward to the President's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the President. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Donald M. Berwick, President Emeritus and Senior Fellow of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Donald Berwick, one of the nation's leading authorities on healthcare quality and safety, was administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, a federal agency which covers approximately 100 million people through Medicare, Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, and the Health Insurance Marketplace. In 18 months, he stabilized the organization and initiated experiments in healthcare delivery improvement throughout the country. He co-founded and served for 20 years as CEO of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. In that position, he was a key figure nationally and internationally. He stressed the need for evidence to dictate healthcare organization and delivery. Berwick is a remarkably imaginative and effective practitioner of fact-based effective healthcare policy. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations, Tony. <coughs> Congratulations and welcome. Will Dr. Ronald M. Fairman please come forward to the President's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the President. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Ronald M. Fairman, Chief of Vascular Surgery and Endovascular Therapy, Vice Chairman for Clinical Affairs in the Department of Surgery, and Professor of Surgery in Radiology at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. A pioneer in endovascular surgery, Ronald Fairman has played a central role in shaping an entirely new field of medicine, endovascular therapy. This field has transformed and vastly improved the care of patients afflicted with blood vessel disorders, such as aneurysms of the thoracic and abdominal aorta, and blockage of arteries, such as the carotid, renal, and femoral. In this new treatment complex, <coughs> complex devices are inserted via catheters into peripheral arteries, and with radiographic imaging, advanced centrally to stent or seal off aortic aneurysms or to open and restore flow to narrowed or occluded arteries. Thus, intricate but less invasive procedures are substituted for major or more dangerous ones, such as open operations to remove aneurysms or bypass arterial occlusions. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations. <clears throat> Will Mr. John R. Friedman please come forward to the President's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the President. Mr. President, I have the honor to present John R. Friedman, artist. John Friedman paints landscapes, figure paintings, and commissioned portraits. He also creates assemblages and constructions and site-specific installations. He is best known among APS members as a painter of striking portraits 
that creatively capture the personality and life work of the person. He has painted portraits of many APS members, including Bruce Alberts, David Baltimore, Clyde Barker, Whit Bell, Herman Goldstein, Frank Press, Janet Rowley, Maxine Singer, David Tittle, Harold Varmus, and Charles Vest. A few of the non-APS members whose portraits he has painted are, are Bill and Melinda Gates, Ted Turner, and Barney Frank. Many of his portraits hang in the National Portrait Gallery. He is also an accomplished landscape painter whose works are widely exhibited. But it is as a painter of vivid, realistic portraits that he has become one of the best-known painters in the United States. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society, held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations, Tom. Will Dr. Claudia Golden please step forward to the President's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the President? Mr. President, I have the honor to present Claudia Golden, Henry Lee Professor of Economics at Harvard University. Claudia Golden has made fundamental contributions to our understanding of labor market discrimination, gender roles in employment, the roles of education and health as major components of human capital, and the role of human capital in economic growth. She constructs a pollution model of discrimination in which a new female hire may reduce the prestige of a previously all-male occupation. According to the model, occupations requiring productivity above the female median will tend to be segregated, while those below the median will tend to be integrated. In her analysis of the economic slowdown in the United States in the 1970s, she finds that rising levels of inequality at the end of the 20th century was the root of the problem not slow productivity growth or economic convergence between nations. In all her work, she has illuminated fundamental questions of economic and social development. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations. Will Dr. Richard Ovenden please come forward to the President's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the President. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Richard Ovenden, Bodley's Librarian of the Bodleian Libraries at the University of Oxford. His previous roles include positions at the House of Lords Library, the National Library of Scotland, and at the University of Edinburgh, where he was Director of Collections, responsible for integrating the library, the university museums, and art gallery. Richard Ovenden has combined a career in academic librarianship with a research interest in the history of ideas and in the history of communication, especially the history of the book and the history of photography. He has developed a deep knowledge of digital technologies and their application to scholarship and learning working in major collaborations with bodies such as Google, the University of Michigan, New York Public Library, the Royal Collections, the Folger Shakespeare Library, and the Biblioteca Apostolica Vaticana. He has developed concern for raising understanding in society for the importance of digital preservation, acting as principal investigator on several major research projects, and chairing an international consortium of memory institutions dedicated to promoting research and good practice. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations. <clears throat> Congratulations. Will Dr. Alar Tamure please come forward to the President's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the President. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Alara Tamare, Professor of Applied Math Emeritus at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. 
Alar Tamare has been a true pioneer with his elegant and prescient studies, starting more than 40 years ago, of the evolution of the structure of galaxies. He introduced to these studies numerical simulation at a time when very clever approaches were needed to obtain useful results due to the limitations of computer capabilities in that era. He also developed the deep stability criterion, the so-called Q criterion for differentially rotating stellar disks. He was, in addition, the first to suggest and demonstrate that elliptical galaxies result from collisions of spiral galaxies. His early studies of galactic mergers were spectacular achievements. Overall, Tomre's work has had a profound influence on the understanding of galactic dynamics and has largely set the direction of research in this now very vigorous and active field. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Will Dr. Lothar von Falkenhausen please come forward to the President's desk to sign the roll book and then receive a formal welcome from the President. Mr. President, I have the honor to present Lothar von Falkenhausen, Professor in the Department of the History of Art, Director of the East Asian Archaeology Library, Kotzen Institute of Archaeology, at the University of California, Los Angeles. Lothar von Falkenhausen is the leading archaeologist of China of his generation. A polyglot like few others, he has taught, each time in the local language, as visiting professor in Beijing, Munster, Hong Kong, Kyoto, Paris, and Heidelberg. His most recent book, Chinese Society in the Age of Confucius, by now translated into Japanese, Chinese, and Korean, is the definitive social history of Bronze Age China. His vast list of publications ranges from antiquarianism to ancient musical instruments, and further on to ancient salt production, empire, and urban studies, questions of literacy and orality in the Chinese canon, philosophical perspectives in Chinese ritual, religious mortuary practices, and social ranking in tombs. His work is as transnational as it is interdisciplinary, ranging across continents and centuries. By the authority and in the name of the American Philosophical Society, held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge, I do admit you a member thereof. Congratulations. Congratulations.